Today is our first class meeting after we have essentially wrapped up DC circuits. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today is the concept of inductance and the behavior of the electrical component, the inductor. And Friday, we will talk about its counterpart component, uh, the capacitor. Okay. Both of these circuit elements are a form of temporary energy storage, and they influence how a circuit behaves as a function of time. <clears throat> so let's talk about what an inductor is first. Excuse me. So I'm going to try to draw something here, uh, and I'm going to apologize if it looks crappier than I intend. My first thing here is at a cylinder. And then the second thing that I'm going to draw is a pair of concentric circles. All right, <clears throat> so these two things here constitute what I'm going to call the core material for our inductors. And so wrapped around these cores will be a wire, which I'm going to draw here in blue. So if we wrap a wire around a core, like so, we have what's called a solenoidal inductor. And if we wrap a wire around this donut shape. we will have what's called a toroidal inductor. So I'm gonna draw this as if the wire is carrying some current I, like so. And what will happen if we have a wire carrying a steady current is that a magnetic field will originate, which wraps around the wire itself. So if we have just a section of wire, I guess I'll draw it in blue since I've been doing it in blue a moment ago. We have a section of wire like so carrying some steady current I, then we should observe a magnetic field I'm drawing here in green, wrapping around the wire. So in our solenoidal coil, our solenoidal inductor, we'll see a magnetic field that's focused in one direction in the core. And in our toroidal inductor, we'll see a magnetic field 
it's focused and circulates around our toroidal core, like so. So <clears throat> these coils concentrate the magnetic field into a particular area. And that magnetic field is the form of temporary energy storage for this device. Okay. So <clears throat> there is a property known as magnetic flux. Have any of you guys had physics 202 yet? Nobody. Okay. So all magnetic flux means is it's the amount of magnetic field distributed over a given area. Okay. So the magnetic flux which has a symbol of phi B is equal to the inductance L, which is really just a purely geometric property, <clears throat> multiplied by the current I. And so from this definition, we can define inductance L as simply the ratio of the magnetic flux phi B divided by the amount of current that causes the magnetic flux I. And we'll have units of Weber's per ampere, which is the same as a volt second per ampere. And we call this a Henry. The symbol H. So Henry's are the units of inductance. Is that yes. Um, so the naming of the unit of inductance is odd to me. Uh, I'm going to go on a very short rant here. Yeah. Um, the reason why I say it's odd to me is because inductors are, uh, their behavior is effectively defined by what's called Faraday's law of induction, uh, which is literally what we're going to talk about in, in just a moment, very, very briefly, because it doesn't really pertain a whole heck of a lot to this point. Uh, but anyway, inductors behave uh, by following Faraday's law of induction in which a changing amount of electromagnetic flux, which in turn means there's some changing amount of current, induces an electrostatic force or voltage across the elements of the inductor. The units of capacitance are named after Michael Faraday, not the units of inductance, and it just it doesn't make a damn bit of sense to me. Um, I don't remember who Henry was, I don't think he had anything to do with capacitors either, but it's just very, very strange to me that the units of inductance or you know, the units of capacitance are named after the guy that had so much to do with developing the theory of inductance. So anyway, I, that's my little rant. So. <clears throat> so speaking of Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. E, the electromotive force, which is really nothing more than a voltage as far as we as electrical engineers are concerned. Physicists would tell you otherwise. Uh, they're not wrong. Um, so all voltages are uh, an example of an electromotive force but not all electromotive forces are voltages, I guess would be one way to put it. But as far as an electromotive 
change in electromagnetic flux as a function of time divide uh, with respect okay so let me talk about where we can physically uh, physically observe faraday's law of induction in real life and there are two two things one of which probably some of you are more familiar with and the other uh, maybe it's just me who's a big dork and likes these kind of things. Okay. How many of you own a hair dryer or have used a hair dryer? Several people. Okay. How many of you have ever unplugged your hair dryer while it was turned on? What happened? Sparks, right? Sparks and arcing and all that kind of stuff. That is Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. Okay. So what this equation says is that a voltage will be generated anytime there is a change in electromagnetic flux, okay? And the negative sign here comes from what's called Lenz's law, which really just indicates that the change or, or the induced voltage occurs to keep the amount of, trying to keep the amount of uh, elect, uh, magnetic flux constant, okay? So if you have, a hair dryer that's on, it's drawing a large amount of current and therefore generating a large magnetic field and a large amount of magnetic flux. Whenever you unplug it, the change in the flux occurs so rapidly that a voltage is induced large enough to ionize the air between the terminals of your receptacle. That is literally what this equation is describing. Now, uh, another place that Faraday's law of induction is used is the electric guitar. Um, if you have an electric guitar, you have a pickup, which is just a coil of wire wrapped around a ferromagnetic cord, with actually several little ferromagnetic studs, okay? Those magnetic core magnetizes the guitar string. So that when the guitar string vibrates, the amount of magnetic field that the pickup sees changes as a function of time and generates a voltage across the pickup that has the same frequency as the vibration of the guitar strings. That is how an electric guitar tells what note you're playing. Okay, if the, if the string is vibrating at 440 hertz, then it generates a voltage that oscillates at 440 Hertz, which is the frequency of an A note. And then that signal gets passed along to an amplifier and you know, maybe an effects pedal and all that kind of stuff. And you can hear it, Bradley. Um, I to ask this guy right here is Faraday's law of induction. Um, this equation also tells us how speakers, uh, well, uh, is a part of speakers generating a pressure wave. Um, so if you apply a changing voltage to the leads of a speaker, it'll cause um, an electromagnetic force to pull the cone in and out, generating a pressure wave, which is how you hear uh, recorded music and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm I'm a big nerd uh the the inductor is my favorite component i don't know so anyway so tying things back around to circuits let's look at these two relationships and develop a current voltage relationship for an inductor okay so let's talk now about circuit Characteristics that looks terrible of an inductor. So, physically, an inductor is nothing more than a coil of wire. And so, in a schematic diagram, that's what we represent an inductor with. 
literally just a coil. Okay. Might look very similar to a spring. Um, and that is also correct. Um, for uh, You may learn in some of your other classes that you can do, you can apply techniques of circuit analysis to solve um, harmonic systems where you have like a, a spring and a proof mass and a damper and all that kind of stuff. And the spring and the inductor effectively play the same role in those oscillating systems. So anyway, that's why their uh, schematic representation is the same. So this is a two terminal device. It obeys the passive sign convention such that if we have a voltage drop VL across our inductor, the current IL will flow into the positive polarity terminal. Um, so if current's flowing into the positive polarity terminal, we have absorbing power. If current's flowing into the negative polarity terminal, then our inductor is supplying power. This is our first circuit element that isn't a source that is capable of doing something other than absorbing power, okay? So inductors, because they are temporary energy storage, can also supply power to a circuit. Um, from Faraday's law, the voltage drop across an inductor VL of T is negative the change in magnetic flux with respect to time, which gives us L DI L by DT. So we have a current voltage relationship for an inductor that is calculus based, right? So we no longer have a simple relationship, um, you know, like V is equal to I times R, where it's just a simple constant of proportionality. Now we have a derivative based relationship between these two things. This is the first of four equations that we are going to develop, okay? This guy is really important. It tells us a couple of things. All right. The first thing that this equation lets us know about the behavior of an inductor, if we have a constant current flowing through this circuit element, what would be the voltage drop across the element's terminus? Zero, right? because we have a definition that says the voltage is L times the rate of change of the current. So if the current doesn't change, the voltage drop across the inductor has to be zero. So from this, we can say that in a DC circuit, an inductor, behaves like a short circuit. So if you have any DC circuits that you need to analyze that happen to contain an inductor and your homework set for this material will absolutely contain at least one, you simply replace the inductor with a wire and go on about your day. Let me ask you guys what I hope is a fairly obvious question, but how can you tell if a circuit is a DC circuit or an AC circuit? So when we were drawing circuit elements, um, sources and stuff like that, the positive polarity terminal was on top for both a DC source and an AC source. Nick. Pardon? I'm sorry, I can't understand you. No, so a circle source just means it's an independent source and a diamond shaped source means it's a dependent source. Yeah, so if it's an AC voltage or current, so if the circuit is excited by an AC source, the one with a little squiggle, it's an AC circuit. And if it's excited by a DC source, it's a DC circuit, it's literally that easy, okay? So if you're working your homework problem, 
and it's like the voltage, uh, the voltage V1 is five volts is a DC circuit. And if it says something like the voltage V1 is five uh, times cosine 37 T, that's an AC source. And so it's an AC circuit. That's literally how you can tell the difference between the two. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so the second thing that we can observe from this equation, it's maybe a little less obvious than the first one, but it actually might be more critically important. Okay. To illustrate what I'm about to talk about, let's consider a couple of very quick examples, all right? So let's say that I have the current flowing through an inductor like so. And it is starts off at zero. Gradually, this is supposed to be a straight line. Let me give this another crack. Takes 10 amps to come up to, uh, excuse me, it takes one second for the current to increase to 10 amps. And then it stays at 10 amps for a while and then it drops back down to zero. So let's call this three seconds, four seconds, zero seconds over here. If we were to plot the voltage drop across our inductor, and just for this hell of it, let's say that L is one Henry, so our math is easy. What should we expect the voltage across the inductor to look like as a function of time? So whenever the current is increasing, we should expect to see a positive voltage. Whenever the current is decreasing, we should expect to see a negative voltage. And whenever the current is constant, we should expect to see no voltage, right? According to that derivative based relationship. So it should look something like this. Oops. Drew that slightly too far. And the value of this guy is given by L times the derivative, right? So um, we have a slope of 10 amps per second multiplied by one Henry. So that should give us positive 10 volts up here. And we have a slope of negative 10 when it's decreasing. So it'll give us negative 10 volts down there, okay? What would happen if the current increased from zero to 10 amps in 0.1 second instead of one second. The voltage would be 10 times as big, right? And so if uh, the current increased 10 amps in 0.01 seconds, the voltage would increase by a factor of 100. So what happens if, we have a current waveform like this, where the current increases instantaneously from zero amps to 10 amps. What should our corresponding voltage waveform look like. Exactly right. If the current were allowed to change instantaneously, we would observe a unit impulse function 
at t is equal to one second direction up and an impulse function where uh, any of you guys know what an impulse function is? Have you had that in your calculus classes and stuff? So an impulse function, uh, all that really means is that the value goes to infinity, but the area under the curve is exactly one. Um, so it's as skinny, as infinitely skinny as it is infinitely tall so that the area is one. So we would see an infinitely large voltage at T is equal to one second. Uh, an infinitely po positive voltage at t is equal to one second and an infinitely negative voltage at t is equal to three seconds. What does having an infinite voltage imply? I disagree. I also disagree. So voltage is the work being done to move charge from one point in a circuit to another. So if we have an infinitely large voltage, that means we're doing an infinite amount of work in an infinitesimal amount of time. Is that physically possible? No, absolutely not. So we can say that the current, and I'm gonna put, a couple of lines under here to emphasize it. In an inductor, cannot change abruptly. This statement here is critically important to our understanding of how circuits behave as a function of time, okay? And by that, I mean, when we were talking about the hairdryer thing, right? Where if you unplug it, the, um, you start to see sparks and all that kind of stuff arcing between the, the two prongs of the receptacle. And it's because you, you would think that when you turn the current off by unplugging it, it ceases to flow, but because of the large inductance of the hairdryer, it can't, okay? Current continues to flow, inducing that voltage, causing those sparks. So it takes some amount of time for the current to decay through the resistance of the hairdryer before it actually ceases working, okay? That's what this uh, relationship is really describing, okay? We cannot see an instantaneous change in the current. We need to have a continuous function for our current, okay? All right, um, how do you guys feel about this derivative-based relationship? V is equal to L di by dt. Anything wild or crazy? All right. The next relationship that we are going to effectively derive here is just taking this guy and rearranging it slightly um, because this guy tells us what the voltage is if we know what the current is. So now we need a relationship that tells us what the current is for a known voltage. So we can mathematically rearrange that expression. And what we'll find is that we get the current flowing through an inductor is one over L times the integral from negative infinity to T of the voltage drop across the inductor as a function of time, where X here is just a dummy variable for time, okay? We can rewrite this equation very slightly to say that the current flowing through an inductor is one over the inductance times the integral from T naught, some point in time where we know what the inductor current is to some later point in time we are interested in. Uh, so that integral VL of x dx plus il 
at T naught. So I want to make it very clear. This bit right here is what's known as the initial condition on the inductor, okay? And it is not inside the integral. So let's see, let's call this guy equation two. Our third equation will be the power relationship for an inductor, where power, as per usual, is simply the product of the voltage and the current. So that's IL multiplied by VL, which we can write as L I times DI by DT, where we've just substituted the voltage relationship. Uh, v is equal to L DI by DT into here and just organize things a little bit. So it's kind of interesting here that the power absorbed by an inductor is dependent on the current and the rate at which the current changes. So that if we know only the current, we have a means by which to determine our uh, power. But if we know the voltage, we have to do a little bit of work. And then lastly, our energy relationship. So I'm gonna ask you guys to not write this next bit of the equation down. I'm gonna talk us through it. It's, it has nothing to do with what I expect you guys to know. So it's just kind of a waste of your time, all right? But we'll, we'll derive it, okay? So the energy absorbed by an inductor is the integral from negative infinity to whatever time we're interested in of, the power being absorbed by the inductor should make sense, right? Well, if we substitute in our relationship for power, we're gonna have negative infinity to T of L I L E I L with respect to time. And so, Sorry, uh, these should be, all be X's, not T's. My apologies. And then I should have a DX up here as well, right? So I'm just integrating my power with respect to my dummy variable that represents time. These DX's cancel each other out. And so now I have an integral where the quantity that's changing or that I'm integrating with respect to is the current itself. So that's going to change the bounds on my integral so that now I'm integrating from the current at negative infinity to the current at a time I'm interested in of L I L Okay. So with L being a constant and I L being our variable, this simplifies to one half L times the square of the current, where we're making an assumption here. And that assumption is that at T is equal to negative infinity, the beginning of the universe, if you will, there was no current flowing through the inductor. Okay, so the energy stored in an inductor depends only on the amount of current that is flowing through the inductor. So inductors are all about what's happening with the current. 
tells us how much energy is stored, tells us how much power is being absorbed, tells us what the voltage drop across it is. All of those quantities are related to understanding how the current through an inductor behaves. That's the most important quantity that we could possibly know. So <clears throat> this is equation four. These are the four equations that you need to burn into your brain to understand how inductors work in a circuit. Okay? Gives us all of the different things that we could possibly want to know. Current, voltage, power, and energy. Right? So the last thing that I would like to talk about today before I let you guys take a crack at your in-class assignments is how to combine inductors and circuits because there might be instances where you have inductors in series or inductors in parallel. And so we can derive these relationships by using Kirchhoff's voltage law and Kirchhoff's current law, just like we did with resistors. Um, but we're going to have a little bit of calculus thrown in the mix, but it's not going to make things too bad. Okay. So let's say that we have several inductors. So let's call this guy L1. This guy L2. This guy L sub N. All connected in series. And there is a voltage drop V of T across all of these inductors. And they are all carrying the same current I of T because they're all connected in series. Everybody with me thus far? If we call the voltage drop across inductor L1 V1, Voltage drop across inductor two, V2, all the way out to the voltage drop across inductor Vn, uh, Ln, V sub n. And we apply KVL, we'll find that V, the total voltage drop, is simply V1 plus V2 plus. V sub n, and we can now use our first equation to express all of these voltage drops in terms of that common current flowing through all of the inductors as L1 di by dt plus L2 di by dt plus L sub n, di by dt. And we effectively have a common factor of the derivative of the current for all of these. So we find that we get L1 plus L2 plus L sub n, sorry, multiplied by di by dt. And from this, we can see that the equivalent inductance is simply L1 plus L2 plus L sub n, or inductors in series combine like resistors. In series. So, how do you think inductors in parallel combine? Like resistors in parallel. Absolutely. We can derive it if you want me to, but it's just adding a bunch of integrals together. It's kind of pointless. So, um, for inductors, uh, we can just say here inductors in parallel combine like resistors in parallel. 
All right. So you guys want me to work an example problem illustrating some of these relationships, or do you want to work on your in-class assignment and kind of figure stuff out? The option is up to you guys. In class. I got a couple of votes for in class and nobody else is saying anything. So if you want me, pardon? An example. All right. So we got two people for in class, one person for example. All right. Lots of people saying example. Okay. So this is nothing more than a little bit of applied calculus. It truly isn't particularly difficult. All right. So let's say that we have an L is equal to 250 millihenry inductor. And the voltage drop across this inductor is given by the piecewise function. It's zero volts for T less than zero seconds. And it is five E to the negative four T volts for T greater than or equal zero seconds. So let me ask you guys a question just real quick. Is the voltage drop across our inductor here a continuous function? No, right? If we plotted this inductor voltage as a function of time, Here's VL of T, here's T. It would look something like this. It would be zero, and then it would jump up instantaneously to five. And then exponentially decay, right? Where this bit looks like five E to the minus four T. Is this okay? Are we violating any rules here? Pardon? No, because this is the voltage, not the current. It's only the current that cannot change abruptly. The voltage can absolutely be a discontinuous function and everything is okay. Only the current has to be continuous. So only the current cannot change abruptly. So the voltage can jump up or jump down or do whatever it needs to, as long as the current is a continuous function where we're at, okay? So let's say that our inductor current at T e is equal to zero seconds is known to be two amps. And we want to find the inductor current as a function of time, the inductor power as a function of time, and the energy stored by the inductor as a function of time. Okay. We're gonna work through these things in this order, all right? So we know how the inductor voltage behaves and we want to figure out what's going on with the inductor current, which of our four numbered equations should we apply? Number two, exactly right, okay. So the equation that we're going to apply is I L, is equal to one over L integral from T naught to T of VL uh, 
of t by dx plus i l at t naught. All right. So it's literally just substituting in numbers here and making sure that we do the calculus correctly, right? So one over L is gonna be one over 250 times 10 to the minus three Henry's, where if you go back in your notes, a Henry is a volt second per ampere, okay? So volt seconds should be in my denominator. Ampere should be in my numerator. Then I'm integrating from T naught, which is the time at which I know the inductor current. So that would be T is equal to zero seconds based on the problem statement information. Two, some later point in time t of my inductor voltage, 5e to the minus 4t volts. Sorry, this should technically be x. The x plus my initial condition, which is 2a. So let's take a moment to look at the units, okay? So my one over inductance has units of amps per volt second. And I'm multiplying that by an integral where I'm integrating the voltage. So what should the integral of voltage have units of? Volt seconds, exactly right. So I have amps per volt seconds multiplied by volt seconds, which is giving me amps. And then to that, I add the initial condition, which is also an amps, so that the current flowing through the inductor is given in amps. So the units absolutely work out. The reason why I am harping on this is because there are some problems in your next couple of homework sets where if you're not paying attention to the units pretty steadfastly, you're very likely to wind up getting frustrated with getting the wrong answer over and over and over again. And it's because uh, the units really, really matter when you do these analytical solutions for these inductor problems and capacitor problems, as you'll see. Okay. So let's move along with this integration. All right. So we have a factor of one amp divided by 250 times 10 to the minus three volt seconds. My five volts is a constant. So I can just pull that to the outside here so that I will have the integral from zero seconds to T of E to the minus four X dx plus two amps. So how do I take the integral of an exponential function? Okay. So as a quick aside, because you guys are gonna be expected to do this multiple times in your homeworks and potentially on your exams, and that line isn't remotely straight, I apologize. The derivative of e to the alpha t is alpha e to the alpha t and the integral of e to the alpha t is one over alpha e to the alpha t. So in this case, alpha is negative four. So we need to pull that down and divide by it. So that's gonna look like one amp divided by 250 times 10 to the minus three volt seconds times five volts times negative one over four. So what should my units here be? What should the units of this four be? 
per second because x is a dummy variable for time. So the, the exponential function should not have units whatsoever. So if the argument is negative four something multiplied by time measured in seconds, and that needs to be a unitless quantity, and that four has to have units of per second. And we should see that pretty easily as well. So if it were seconds, we'd wind up having amps per second squared as units of current, which can't be correct. So the, the unit on the four has to be per second so that it cancels out the seconds in the denominator of our one over inductance term. Seconds to the negative one power. I'll try to write it a little bit better. No problem. And so now I'm going to have E to the minus four T minus E to the zero, which is what? One. All of this plus two amps. And so this should come out to be negative five amps times e to the minus four t minus one plus two amps, which I can write as seven minus five e to the minus four t. So that is our inductor current. That's the hard part. Anybody have any questions about the amount of calculus involved? I think I told you that, uh, guys this previously, but with respect to this class, the amount of calculus I expect you to be able to do is to integrate and differentiate exponential functions, which is what's given right up there. And then later on in the class, I will expect you to be able to integrate and differentiate sinusoidal functions. So only cosine and sine functions. Okay. Everything other than that should, for the most part, um, be, a, uh, you should be able to do the integrals by taking the area under the curve of rectangles and triangles and all that kind of jazz and do derivatives by effectively just taking the slope of a waveform. Okay, so let's talk about our power. What do you think would be the easiest way to determine our power? And so by that, I mean, we have two options. We can take VL, multiply it by IL, or we can do L, times IL times the derivative of that. Option one or option two? This guy is one, and this guy is two. Cool, because we already know what the voltage is, so why would we bother taking the derivative uh, of the current when that's the opposite of all that work we just did, right? So if VL is five e to the negative four t volts, and IL is seven minus five e to the negative four t amps, when I multiply these guys together, I get 35 e to the negative 4t minus 25 e to the negative 8t plus. Right? Done.
just in case some of you may have forgotten how multiplying exponential functions work. If I have e to the x multiplied by e to the y, that is e to the x plus y. All right, last thing here. Oh, goodness. Our inductor energy. So, oh, are we going to integrate the power? Hell no. Okay. We're going to square the current and multiply it by one half L. That's much, much easier than integrating the power would ever be. All right. So, the energy absorbed by an inductor is one half L times the inductor current quantity squared. So that's gonna look like one half times 250 times 10 to the minus three volt second amperes times Seven minus five e to the negative four t amps already squared. So let's look, excuse me, let's look at these units real quick. Okay. So I have volt seconds per amp multiplied by amps, giving me volt seconds, multiplied by another amps, which gives me volt amperes seconds. What's a volt times an ampere? A watt. What's a watt times a second? A joule energy. Right? Okay, so I might run out of room here, but it'll be okay. Um, so let's call this 125 times 10 to the minus 3 volt seconds per amperes times 49 amp squared uh, minus 70 e to the minus 4t amp squared plus 25 e to the minus 8t squared where I got those coefficients just by foiling this thing out right catch that and so this is going to look like 6.125 minus 8.75 e to the minus 4t plus 3.125 e to the minus 8t joules. This is probably one of the hardest problems. I couldn't ask you to do all of this on a test effectively. <laughs> 